Awesome, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, so I guess building on some of the, the topics we talked about already today, um, I think some of many people in the room are aware of Silver Spring Networks, uh, and probably many of you are not. We're a 12-year-old company that's grown up alongside the, the evolution of utilities and cities who are looking to connect a whole range of new services and, and infrastructure. And so today what I wanted to talk about was kind of reflect on what we've seen over the last 10 years in the smart grid development in, um, in the US market and then look at how utilities and cities compare and then uh, looking forward see what I think the four key lessons are that successful cities will need to uh, adopt to embrace the, the maximum benefits from smart city technologies. So um, many countries have had a different approach and different uh, route through smart grid uh, development. For, for us, and indeed for much of the US market, it started with this, with uh, an electricity meter. And around 12, 10 or 12 years ago, stimulus funding became available to, um, to enable remote reading of electricity meters. And it started with quite a simple business case around avoiding visiting customers' homes, avoiding estimated bills, and deploying new tariffs that could vary in price during the course of the day. And so utilities initially thought about this as a metering problem. And so they spoke to the, the companies that made meters and asked, can you put a radio in your system? And uh, a range of proprietary systems were rolled out, drive-by solutions were experimented with. And at that time, Silver Spring Networks was formed by a team who'd been involved in uh, some of the early technology development in the internet um, development and recognized that actually this was an opportunity for utilities to deploy uh, a network which could do a lot more than smart metering. By, by choosing open standards and a flexible structure, they could achieve their aims today but then actually have a, a roadmap of innovation. And so we were lucky enough to win some early customers and, um, and kind of go on that journey with them. So what happened next? Uh, the first thing really was that customers felt very left out. The, the early deployments in the US were typified by rejected meters from, from end users, people unsure where their benefits were, um, people's bills actually going up because they misunderstood the new tariffs. And so utilities quickly learned that it was essentially engaged with uh, the, the customers who previously had often been thought of as merely endpoints for them. And they also found that if they gave those uh, citizens tools to actually access the data that was coming off these devices. Um, not only did they get that engagement they were looking for and the support, but actually found that the energy savings achieved were, were even higher. So around there, um, standards started to emerge to share the data from the meters with different devices. And in turn, an ecosystem of different uh, devices and systems began to emerge around that smart meter. So whether that was home heating systems or automated pool pumps uh, or some of these other applications that are relevant in the US market. Uh, utilities also found that they could kind of piggyback on, on many of the components of the smart metering system they'd use to accelerate or improve other projects they were working on. So whether that was um, electric vehicle charging programs or solar, um, solar panels as we have here. And that could be leveraging the communication network to enable more effective or more reliable communication or actually using the customer tools that had been deployed to give consumers more information on solar generation. And in parallel to this, they started to look more broadly across the end-to-end -end, um, uh, grid uh, and started to gather data from right across the, the generation system with additional sensors that were um, attached to the network at different points, controllers um, connecting in pre-existing data sources that could now be linked into this and combined with the data from the smart meters and they found they were again able to unlock a whole range of new uh, benefits and use cases and some quite advanced analytics started to emerge um, which were being done either locally at the meter, uh, at substations or indeed at a centralised level, combining all the data from these different sources to perhaps uh, identify energy theft, something that's very important in uh, developing markets and uh, or indeed to identify appliances within a home to help give customers more tailored and more appropriate energy saving advice. And so 
Um, that, that journey continues, but probably the main message is that, that utilities have found that, that that meter is actually part of a, has become a platform for ongoing innovation. And, um, and they have a very integrated view of how they want to progress. So that's really been the, the progression for, for our business and our technology as well. Um, through the use of open standard platforms, we've worked with utilities around the world, US, uh, market leader Australia, um, here in the UK, major projects with UK power networks down in London looking at active network management of solar and wind. And it was around four years ago we started working with cities as well to look at how they could leverage the same principles and technology um, to achieve the goals they were looking at. And that started with utility owned assets such as street lighting or electric vehicle charging. But once we started working with cities, we learned that actually uh, there was benefits for them in connecting traffic signal controllers, air quality monitors and a, and a broad range of city assets. Uh, and in the last kind of 18 months, we've seen this explosion of, I suppose, diversity of what cities and to some extent utilities want to connect, but also a, a much greater appetite to combine the data from all these different sources together and, and make more intelligent use of that. So um, today we've got networks in over 500 cities around the world, uh, connect over 23 million devices, and probably our main focus has been on critical infrastructure or, or uh, applications where they uh, particularly look for reliability, security, and some of these other features that were relevant in the utility market. So how do cities and utilities compare? Well, there's some, definitely some clear parallels. Uh, first of all, the appetite, which I mentioned earlier on, uh, a real growing recognition of the benefits that can be found by gathering data from different sources, enabling remote connectivity. Um, also, there's a desire to try and be more efficient with, um, with parallel systems and collaboration, but there's probably more barriers on the city side than, than utilities, which I'll, I'll touch on shortly. Uh, and finally, they have quite long um, procurement processes, which is something that impacts how they approach technology, and particularly in fast-moving technology markets, that's um, something to be worked around. But there are some key differences I think one of the main ones we found as we looked at the market was the, the fragmentation and the impact that has on how, uh, how solutions are developed. So where there are, you know, in the hundreds of util large utilities in the world, um, there are tens of thousands of large cities in the world. And, uh, you know, this is an image of London here, which actually, London obviously our largest city in the UK, but in fact it's 32 individual boroughs which uh, each have their own agenda, their own budgets, uh, governance structure. Uh, and linked to that, cities are far more siloed than utilities. Uh, and it's, it's much more challenging to try and create alignment, combine budgets and, and otherwise. And that again is something, as we look at smart cities, which is very often about uh, leveraging uh, data or assets across a system, that can be a, a quite a strong barrier to work around. And uh, the other key difference is there's a larger role of outsourcing um, of services uh, and very often councils will have a range of their service outsourced through sh um, short, medium or long term contracts and that can, again can have a, a bearing on how technology is, is procured or selected. The drivers for cities I think are, you know, you can create a list of, of, of the common drivers for cities of why they want to try and innovate their services. Um, but the priority, the relevant priority and, and target timing of those varies quite significantly between cities based on political pressure, pre-existing investment or, or a range of other factors. And um, so as a result, there's no kind of cookie cutter approach for, for smart cities. Uh, and we see cities will need to adopt a flexible approach to, to ensure that they can respond as those priorities change. Um, one of the other um, interesting aspects is the, the, the increasing role of competitiveness between cities. I think as the world becomes more globalised, cities recognise that to attract investment, um, top talent companies, they have to, that quality of life is a, is a key factor in people deciding to live in a city. And so beyond just the core um, energy saving or environmental benefits, that quality of life aspect continues to be important. And in terms of the devices that, that cities are looking at connecting, it's really a very broad range. Um, that, and that's a, 
from new assets that are, are being deployed, new services that are being deployed, such as electric vehicle chargers or city information panels, um, through to pre-existing assets that have never been connected, like street lights or advertising panels, which can be uh, improved, uh, or indeed systems that have been connected, but they want to make better use of the data, so perhaps weather stations or, or such like. And one thing that we found over the last two years is that uh, street lighting is being recognised as one uh, a very important enabler for cities. And you know we've heard a lot about street lighting today, and I think that's largely because it has come through as one of the flagship smart city projects that has all the right pieces in place. So it has mature technology that's proven, it has effective standards that can be used for interoperability, and it has a credible business case that can have paybacks, as we heard described earlier on. You look across many of the other smart city applications and they're at a different stage in that cycle. And so it will continue to be a, um, a process of, of experimentation. So um, leading on now to the, the four lessons that I think are going to be important for, for cities to take, in, take on board to be successful, and indeed many of them are, uh, are leading the way in this today already. So uh, the first is the importance of open ecosystems. And so this is both in terms of the use of standards, but also the, the kind of approach and attitude cities have in how they work with suppliers. Um, we, don't, we don't expect any one company to solve the smart city market. Um, and indeed, it will, will, success will be delivered by collaboration and, and cooperation. And so, you know, to give an example that we've all seen in the telecom market, um, you know, Nokia and, and BlackBerry were very trusted technologies, highly adopted, uh, but they weren't built around enabling third-party um, uh, interoperability or, or involvement. And as a result, they were relatively slow to innovate, and it was incremental innovation driven by an in-house team. And as a comparison, if we look at the, the dominant players now, uh, Android and Apple, they have uh, built their whole case around enabling people to improve and innovate on their platform. And that makes innovation much more rapid uh, and indeed uh, more future-proof because uh, as conditions change, they're able to, to adapt. And so we believe that model is going to be important in the, in the smart city market. And that's something actually that Glasgow, uh, the Future City Demonstrator program, has been highly successful at, um, at enabling. Their open by default uh, tagline, I think, relates both to the data, uh, provision of data, but also to the principles they used in enabling interoperability across the broad range of programs that were included in the project. We were um, delivering the intelligent street lighting aspect with uh, three sites across the city connecting LEDs for energy saving, but also bringing in data from traffic monitoring cameras, air quality monitoring, and noise monitoring. And that data was then um, interfaced across a whole range of different parts of the system because they'd, they'd considered that interoperability up front. Second way is uh, cities need to find a way to share across silos. Um, and I think the sharing can relate to a whole range of different areas from budgets, um, uh, of course, data, but also just understanding the the challenges that are being faced and finding ways to improve business cases by recognizing. And I think that um, that challenge will probably be different for different cities. Um, Glasgow have been effective at using the Future City Demonstrator program to, to move that, map that forward and create greater visibility. Uh, Copenhagen, who we work with, have created a dedicated smart city council and an innovation lab in the street to, to allow people to come and, uh, and play. Uh, Stockholm have used EU funding to, to, to do tactical projects which bring, bring different teams together. Uh, and Paris are targeting specific outsourcing procurements and trying to merge those in a sensible and um, efficient way to, to, to kind of leverage technology. And so they, when they were recently looking at upgrading their street lighting control system, they recognized that actually their traffic signal control system was also in need of upgrade, and those were combined into a common procurement, which was our initial um, project in the city. So we connect uh, control over 150,000 lights in the city and traffic signals. And, but they now want to use that same network infrastructure and software system to extend benefits to a, a range of other connected infrastructure applications, such as um, 
advertising panels, EV charging, and they see that as a long-term um, innovation. Okay, so I'll be fast from here. So the, the, the third is that smart cities, uh, we believe has to be seen as a process, not as a technology or a kind of one-stop solution. So that is in part planning for upgrading over time, so considering how the system will evolve and grow, so the capability to deploy new firmware, the capability to extend functionality. Um, and Copenhagen, I mentioned already, they had a, they've got a very aggressive carbon reduction target, looking to be carbon neutral by 2025. And to achieve that, they recognize that they need to incrementally make improvements over time. So their smart lighting program, which is 20,000 lights across the city, was very aggressive. And afterwards, they recognized that there was some conflict with their uh, cycling promotion, which is a separate um, initiative to try and increase cycling in the city. And so they've been able to enable functionality which will uh, improve cycle safety um, through controlling of the lights in a, a system that was specified two years after the original lighting solution. Uh, uh, creating a governance structure so that systems can interoperate, uh, I think relies on having uh, initial planning on how a common methodology can be used by different teams over time. And again, this is something that Glasgow have been very effective with in setting out a, a program which has common uh, objectives, which can be applied to different, different initiatives. And uh, one of those being security, that's an area that we think is particularly important to have a high level and consistent view, because it's very hard to retrofit. And uh, as we see data being used more broadly in many different ways, um, uh, it's important to have a common attitude to that. And um, we already see our incidents around the world of, of hacking of systems with, with perhaps early day or pr proprietary technology. And it's often said, well, why would anyone hack uh, a particular system? But the reality is people will always find a reason, uh, even if it's for their own entertainment or otherwise. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the final point uh, to wrap up is the importance of putting citizen benefits at the core of smart city initiatives rather than it being seen as a means in itself. And to, to run through a couple of quick examples, uh, Copenhagen, as I mentioned, uh, have done a, a citywide LED upgrade, but one of the, the things they're most proud of is how they started that process, which was with developing a lighting master plan where they walked every street in the city with the contractor to speak to businesses, local residents, and find out what lighting meant to them and what could be achieved. So they, they got the maximum benefit as they, they did that um, upgrade. Um, cities are changing the way they engage with their um, citizens by leveraging social media platforms. Um, and uh, very quickly on this one, a, a large scale project in Florida, the utility there who have upgraded over 500,000 lights in a, a massive program across the world, uh, sorry, across the state, I should say. They um, had particular interest in 750 sites that were relevant to a particular citizen, which was the turtles that had particular breeding patterns that could be affected by the lighting and so they've they've built specific functionality into the system for those 750 sites um, the final one here is one that some may be familiar with another street lighting um, uh, example and this is one that came out of bristol with a focus on changing cities citizens um, perception of, of lighting and so they essentially hacked uh, 12 lights street lights across the city, city fitted them with um, projectors that would record the, um, the, if I can get this to play, um, record the shadows of citizens walking past and then replay it for those. It's not playing on the screen, unfortunately, but um, it's well worth a look, the shadowing project, which is a way of the city uh, changing how people saw, the, saw the, the role of street lighting in their city. So thank you very much and uh, look forward to questions later.